You don't have to. Here's the contract. Party of the first part gets the party of the second part, and his associates full power to do with him at their pleasure, to rule, to send, to fetch, or carry him or his, be it either body, soul, flesh, blood, or goods. Ink isn't worth anything to me, Winslow. No sign. Now we're in business. Together. Forever. Discussions and discourses on the exploitative nature of generative AI and its effects on the art and entertainment industry are both exhausted to death and yet somehow ever present in today's zeitgeist. In Hollywood, the demands of both the writers and actor strikes and their points of contention are regarding the use of AI. Screenwriters do not want their work submitted into an algorithm or to be ordered by studios to edit AI-generated scripts. And actors do not want their image and likeness to be forever in the possession of studios who are free to use them at any point in the future. These discussions on artist exploitation extend to the world of video game voice actors, and digital artists on platforms like DeviantArt. Now, many writers, journalists, and even YouTubers have covered this topic in ways that are much more nuanced and deconstruct the fallacy of relying on AI over human hands. We here at Broadly Specific are not experts on the topic ourselves, and we'll leave it to people more knowledgeable in presenting that kind of contribution to the discourse. Instead, in this brief video, let's try something different. Let's try to frame this topic of AI and artist exploitation through one film in particular, Brian De Palma's 1974 Phantom of the Paradise. In the days of Eld, people used folklore and myth to convey cautionary tales to children and the next generation. Common wisdom and warnings were passed down to descendants through bedtime stories and campfire tales. The Danish folk tale, The Emperor's New Clothes, warned people of groupthink, where people's desire to conform makes them irrational or go against their logical thinking. The Indonesian folk tale, Maleng Kundang, about a son gaining success and abandoning his poor and raggedy mother, leading to his ship sinking and him turning into stone, was a rather extreme tale to teach children to respect, be grateful to, and obey their parents. And the German folk tale, Little Sucker Thumb, teaches children to, well, not suck their thumbs. Or else. Of course, some films can be considered modern myths as well. They try to understand and convey how life should be lived. However, while old folk tales, such as those mentioned prior, were created to enforce conformity, obedience, and proper etiquette, Film can offer more nuanced discussions on morality, warnings and predictions, whether intended or otherwise, to pervasive social and political issues. In terms of artificial intelligence, you have probably seen numerous films, from the Terminator series to Blade Runner, which all offer depictions of the effects of AI sentience. They show AI living among us, or humans subjugating them, leading to retaliation or an introspection on what makes a human human. But Phantom of the Paradise, while not in itself being a film about artificial intelligence, may yet propose a more fitting cautionary tale to the dangers of generative AI to artists and creativity. Let us explain. Obviously, there will be some spoilers for the film, so consider yourself warned. Get to meet the devil Never thought I'd meet him face to face 
heard he always worked alone That he seldom rode or used a phone So I walked right up to meet him at his place Phantom of the Paradise comes from the mind of Brian De Palma, an iconic director of films like Carrie and Scarface. The film itself is an adaptation of the musical Phantom of the Opera by playwright Andrew Lloyd Webber, which adapts the 1910 French novel of the same name by Gaston Leroux. Phantom of the Paradise is a musical, a rock opera, a gothic horror, a tragedy, and just about everything. In Phantom of the Paradise, we follow songwriter Winslow Leach, played by Bill Finley, whose music captivates famous producer Swan, played by the great Paul Williams. After Winslow's performance following popular Swan-produced band The Juicy Fruits, Winslow's unfinished cantata is taken by Swan's lackey Philbin, played by George Mamoli, under the guise of showing it to Swan. Winslow expects a record deal, but as time passes with no contact, he visits Death Records and is kicked off the premises, later discovering that Swan is holding an audition for female singers to play Winslow's own songs. There, he meets Phoenix, played by Jessica Harper, and is immediately, obsessively, infatuated with her and her voice. After yet again being kicked out, and this time framed, sent to jail for life, and forever disfiguring his face, Winslow transformed into the Phantom, wearing costumes he finds in the Paradise, a rock opera house operated by Swan himself. Winslow goes on to sign a blood contract with Swan to finish his cantata under the condition that his beloved Phoenix would be the one to sing his songs. With his voice stolen, Swan bestows him a new voice, a transmogrified voice of his own, and works day and night to finish his cantata for the sake of Phoenix. Not to spell out the entire film here, but Swan, of course, screws him over one last time, and the Phantom retaliates by haunting the Paradise. Phantom of the Paradise is, on the surface, a very clear-cut satirical criticism of the music industry, and by extension, the entertainment industry a capitalist industry which sees great conflict between businesses and art, where the artist or poet with their creativity, integrity, and aspirations clashes with the businessmen and producers who only see the numbers and sale metrics. This is the lens that Phantom of the Paradise is often academically analyzed with, and the interpretation that most viewers will leave the film with. In this video, we are recontextualizing the film's message as a cautionary tale of generative AI. We'll define the terms as any tool capable of utilizing training data, often stolen from artists and writers without their consent, to generate derivative data in the form of new texts, images, audio, or video from a prompt. You can see this in applications like ChatGPT, Midjourney, or Respeecher, an app capable of imitating a person's voice. Let's go back to Phantom of the Paradise. To fully understand how this work might serve as a warning against generative AI, we must mention one more of the film's influences that we missed. Goethe's Faust, a tragedy play about the titular Faust, a scholar who wishes for knowledge and makes a pact with the devil, selling his soul in the process. In Phantom of the Paradise, Winslow does the same albeit through negligence and ignorance, and signs a blood contract with Swan, practically becoming his slave. He can't even die without his command. Winslow, a naive but passionate songwriter who only cares about his craft, is seduced and tempted by the opportunity to work with this legendary producer, something akin to artists, voice actors, and other creatives who sign on with big corporations to work on their favorite franchise or famous IP. They are then also exploited for their passion similarly. Winslow is locked in a room to work on his cantata without rest, churning out page upon page, only for it to be stolen by Swan without his consent. The cantata is bastardized, desecrated, and mutilated, as Swan turns the songs into different genres to be sung by different singers, not his initially chosen muse, Phoenix. 
Much like artists who unwittingly have their art stolen and fed into a machine for training data, only for it to be regurgitated into something recognizable yet unrecognizable, with the strokes of their brush remaining, AI art is a Frankenstein's monster, an abomination of their work and of other artists, devoid of any meaning or intention. Despite arguments that prompting generative art is a creative process, it is simply an art of production and of instructing a machine. You cannot impart any emotion, experience, or subtle meaning to the resulting image or text. Swan himself signed a deal with the devil, like the Fausts of Goethe's tale. Through the promise of fame and power, he gains the seemingly unlimited power of the devil. Much like those who are seduced by the perceived unlimited possibility of AI, either staying willfully ignorant of its nature or stolen work, or, much like Swan, believing that others' works are their own. In the world of this film, even the public and media perceive Swan as mastermind and author of all of these artists. New artists he co-signs are viewed as another one of his creations, rather than individual artists. It is not only Swan and the music industry, but also the general audience who are complicit in viewing art in such a manner. In Phantom of the Paradise, Swan is the one responsible for something described as the nostalgia wave of the 70s. Swan. He has no other name. He brought the blues to Britain. He brought Liverpool to America. His band, the Juicy Fruits, single-handedly gave birth to the nostalgia wave of the 70s. Appropriating 1950s music with beach aesthetics, before moving on to the edgy and more modern rock and roll. The audience is entranced, not by the quality of the music or the lyrics, but rather its aura, aesthetics, and allure. Doesn't that kind of change the whole thing? You heard what he said, make it yours. As long as it sounds good, nobody's gonna care what it's about. Is that so? Nobody cares what anything's about. Is that right? Who the hell listens to lyrics anyway? Dry up, Tubbo. In the modern era, you might understand this mode of consumption as art as content. We hear everyone use this term nowadays, content, content, content. When a studio executive is thinking about what film or show to make next, they refer to it as content, their lineup of products being referred to not as art, but as content. You might have even heard criticism regarding the term content used adjacent to the criticism of AI. And providers. No, yeah, the content means it's a, something you eat and you throw away. <laughs> content is like, you know, uh, it's candy. I, I don't know what content, it's madness to think you're making content. Which brings us to the term commodity fetishism, where if one thinks that, without reflection, the labor quality of something that is produced and the value that arises from it, a value that is directly created through the amount of labor put into the product, is something that is inherent and excludes the labor that manufactured it. We can bring this concept closer to our argument against AI art by employing the words of German philosopher Walter Benjamin and the concept of the aura that he outlined in his seminal essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction in 1936. If you simply forget that art is produced and that labor was key in its creation, and you are more absorbed with being in contemplative attention of the work, assuming that it has objective value outside of being produced by an artist, then you are commodifying that art. Simply put, if you are seduced by a work of art outside of its existence as a product made by an artist and their intention, you might view that art as a commodity. Beyond the cultivated lifetime of experiences, happiness, trauma, and knowledge that are imparted to a piece of art by an artist, Benjamin posits that the audience itself is part of a piece of art, both the spectator and a critic that become one with the art when they experience it. For instance, when you watch a film, your eye becomes the camera that captures the actors and story through its lens. But unlike real life, the camera reveals to us unconscious optics. The camera's eye, through deliberate techniques that filmmakers employ, shows us that things as we see them in real life aren't necessarily the way things are. Of course, this mode also applies to other mediums. 
This way of creating art with intention and to view it with a deeper contemplation of the labor process behind it is simply not possible with AI art, as the act of prompting an image is devoid of any true creative control, only an illusion of it by a careful selection of keywords. Make no mistake, AI-assisted tools like auto-rotoscoping or any other tool that hastens the creative process is not included in this assessment. Rather, we are discussing generative AI, specifically that which steals someone else's voice and work, much like Winslow's situation in Phantom of the Paradise. While the lens that Winslow writes his song with and his infatuation with Phoenix are the impetus and raison d'etre of Winslow's composition, everything is lost when they are put in the hands of another singer or in front of an audience who do not engage with the true meaning of the lyrics, because the labor process is removed. Swan sees and appreciates the aesthetics of Winslow's art, but views it as a commodity and takes Winslow out of the equation entirely. Going back to Benjamin's concept of the aura in commodifying art, we can see this in Phantom of the Paradise and how the banal aesthetics of 50s nostalgia and the image of rock and roll are marketed without any real substance behind the genres. In the realm of generative AI, people prompt and create AI art or film that tries to emulate another author's work, much like the Wes Anderson AI videos you may have seen, or perhaps tries to reimagine a work as being done by another creator. They have been seduced purely by the aura of those pieces of art, the mere aesthetics that they assume to simply be inherent rather than created through a rigorous creative process and the culmination of the artist's entire life and the way they view the world. Look, we understand that, at first, the seduction of AI art is alluring. Even we here at Broadly Specific were susceptible to it when AI art only just started becoming prominent two years ago. It was interesting and funny creating silly images only by typing a few lines. but. The reality is, not only are we exploiting other artists' works, we are also commodifying art and devaluing its artistic value. We said at the start of the video that this discourse has been exhausted to death, but the reality is, new developments happen every day, and it is worth fighting the good fight and continuing to discuss this. As we were making this video, the actor strike in Hollywood ended, which includes protection, and proper compensation for any AI usage against actors. The writer strike has similarly been over for a while, but the fight remains in other parts of the film industry. For instance, DreamWorks co-founder said that AI will cut the cost of animation movies by cutting many artists from the workforce. And these are only developments in the United States. There is no telling how AI exploitation will be prevalent in other regions and film industries. In the world of gaming, Microsoft just partnered with a company that will bring AI-generated characters and storylines into Xbox games, effectively putting jobs like artists, voice actors, and writers at risk. We can't exactly tell you to use or not use generative AI tools. That is up to your individual position on the matter. But the bottom line is, this is not a simple evolution of art. It might be its extinction as the experiences and intentions of artists in creating art is replaced by art as a commodity, or to put it in modern terms, content. Like in Phantom of the Paradise, the seemingly endless possibility is alluring, but beware when signing a contract with the devil. Be careful that you don't lose your soul. Thank you for watching. This video is brought to you by broadly-specific.com. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And be sure to follow us on our website and social media. If you want to directly support us and gain bonuses like early access, working progresses, shoutouts, and more, consider supporting us on patreon.com slash broadly underscore specific. Thank you to all our patrons and see you next time. Oh, and by the way, Contrary to what some people said about the last video, I am not an AI. Please check out my channel in the description below. Thank you.